Hello, and welcome to The Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm Yuli, and I will be hosting today's episode. Ten years ago, physicists around the world rejoiced when two experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, the ATLAS and the CMS collaborations, announced the discovery of the Higgs boson. It was the latest, long-awaited addition to the standard model of particle physics, the theory that describes all the elementary particles and their interactions with each other. To celebrate this anniversary of this important discovery, today I will talk to Dominic Duda. He is a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Physics in Munich, a member of the ATLAS collaboration, and he does his research on the Higgs boson. We will talk about the role of the Higgs boson in the standard model, how it was discovered, and what has happened since. So stick around, I hope you'll enjoy this episode. Hello, Dominic. Um, thank you for joining this episode of this podcast. Um, why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about yourself and introducing yourself. Hi. First of all, let me say uh, that I'm very happy to be here. So I'm looking very much forward to this podcast. And uh, so I'm Dominic Duda. I'm postdoc here at the Max Planck Institute, and I'm doing research on Higgs boson property studies and searches for new heavy Higgs bosons. Okay, well, um, yeah, so the Higgs boson is what we're going to talk about. So first of all, happy birthday to the Higgs boson. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to be precise, the Higgs boson is not having its birthday. It's like the, we're, we're celebrating the discovery of the Higgs boson. Of course, the Higgs boson is, uh, has the same age than the universe. Or like almost the same. True. The <laughs> Very true. So yes, um, so physicists are celebrating the anniversary of the detection, um, which of course was very exciting back then. Um, so yes, today we kind of want to cover why this was such a big deal in particle physics. And I think we should start by kind of explaining what the Higgs boson actually is. What is a boson? What are the other types of particles that we know? How does it fit into this picture? So maybe you can start. Okay. With so that. the <laughs> so the Higgs boson is, has actually like a special role in the standard model of particle physics. It is the only fundamental uh, spin zero particle that we know. So like like the only scalar particle that we know so far, right? And um, it is related to the process of electroweak symmetry breaking, which is basically the process where like the massive particles in the standard model acquire their mass. Okay, so maybe quickly explain what a spin is. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, uh, it, it's a little bit difficult in the context of quantum mechanics. You could kind of imagine the spin to be basically the self rotation of a particle of a particle around itself okay and then the higgs boson has been zero but yeah all the other particles that we have know either like uh, all the other fundamental particles that we know have either um, half spin these are the so-called fermions or better known as meta particles so they're building basically the world around us and uh, the other uh, particles that we know are the uh, are bosons, and these are the so-called mediator particles for uh, the fundamental interactions, such as the uh, the weak interactions, which are responsible, for example, uh, for beta decays that people hopefully know, or like at least the physicists will know. Radioactive decays, yeah. <laughs> Some exactly. sort of one part of radioactive decay. <laughs> and uh, then we have, of course, the photon, which is connected to um, electromagnetic interactions. Okay. So spin one half particles are the fermions. They make out the matter that we know. And then the bosons are 
exchanging forces between those particles. Exactly, exactly. And then the Higgs boson is a special kind of boson. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As it is connected to the process through which the uh, fermions and bosons obtain their masses. Okay. So, um, how does this work? Like, how does the the particles get their masses with the Higgs boson? Like, how can you imagine so that? So, it, it, it is not actually the Higgs boson, it's the Higgs field, which is like a background field, like, which is like everywhere in the universe, and particles couple with this, or like couple to this field, or like, like some particles do, because we actually also have like massless uh, elementary particles, which do not couple to the field, and through decoupling to this field, the particles obtain their mass. Okay, and then the Higgs boson itself? It's, it's like a quantum mechanic excitation of the Higgs field. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, and this Higgs field is just everywhere in the universe, all the time, yes. yeah. universal. Um, so, I was wondering, because when people think about masses and the field that is acting on masses in the universe, I think most of the minds will probably go to gravity and the gravitational force. Could you maybe explain if that's the same or is something different <laughs> or <how>? so <laughs> gravity is so this is actually like a it, it sounds like an easy question but it's a very complicated one <laughs> because gravity is actually not uh, described by the standard model of particle physics so we we don't really know yet or we can't really prove yet how this basically folds in so gravity is a force that we actually do know it's like the like the the main force we're like confronted on a daily basis, right? And unfortunately we particle physicists are not really sure how how this fits in yet. So this is like one basically one of the major problems of the standard model of particle physics. Yeah. And the big dream of all the <laughs> physicists is at some point uni unify it, right? Exactly. So one thing that we maybe should like mention here is that like the Higgs boson and the process of giving like mass to the other particles make only like a very small fraction of the mass. Like most mass is actually coming from um, binding energy, like basically like nuclear forces between the um, fundamental components of matter. Right. So um, maybe let's quickly me mention here that basically for us physicists, mass and energy is the same thing. So then the Higgs field is actually only the field that gives mass to these single particles. Exactly, to, the, uh, to, all, to the, all the elementary particles, but like in the end, so I just read somewhere that like basically the Higgs field is responsible for 1% of all the mass. Everything else is coming from binding uh, states. Okay. Um, so it's actually not a big part of what we deal with on a daily basis, but still it was a super important discovery. It, it is. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> so like the, the point is that it confirms um, like the assumptions that people made. Um, so we, we, we needed to have like a process to explain where the masses of the elementary particles are coming from. Right, and so like finding, like discovering the Higgs boson was therefore like a very big deal, right? Confirming this process. Otherwise, we would have been confronted with yet another um, like phenomena that the standard model cannot explain. Right. right? And uh, we, we do not want to have rely everything on a theory that is like uh, deeply flawed. True, mm -hmm. that makes sense. So then how long has this theory of the Higgs boson been around? Like who came up with it? Boson? So the theory was like basically published in the 1960s, um, almost simultaneously by Peter Higgs and Francois Eng Engler and some other people that worked on it. And it's like a theory that um, like heavily borrowed 
in other effects that are already seen in nature. So the Higgs mechanism is basically like um, generalization of the so-called uh, Meissner-Oxenfeld effect, which gives an effective mass to photons inside of supra super supraconductors. Okay, so these people then found a way to generalize that and make it work in such a way that it fits into this standard model of particle. E exactly, effects. exactly. And uh, you mentioned it was proposed in the 1960s, so why did it take so long to find the Higgs boson? <laughs> so, uh, like one very crucial part there is, of course, that you need like um, particle colliders that are, first of all, uh, well, can go to high enough energies. So the like we we just found that the Higgs boson, like ten years ago, we found that the Higgs boson has a mass of 125 GeV. It's one of the highest mass elementary particles. Um, only the top quark is more heavy. Of course, this means that you need, as you uh, previously said, like, uh, like energy and mass is basically the same. So you need now an accelerator, particle accelerator, that can reach such a high energy. And so this, this of course, means that you need like the proper technology, but like, ma uh, like energy is not the only measure that is important in this context. The other measure is the so-called luminosity. So basically the amount of Higgs bosons that you can produce. So like luminosity is basically like a quantity that is equivalent to, to some kind of data volume. So, because in the end, particles are produced more often the h larger their cross-section is, right? So, not all particles in the standard model are produced equally often. The Higgs boson itself actually has a relative small cross-section to other processes, right? So, and this means you need to perform a complicated statistical analysis in order to like separate Higgs boson events in the detector from other processes. So since this is not like uh, very simple, you need to have actually a relative large amount of Higgs boson events, right? So we had previous experiments before the Large Hadron Collider that actually got close to discovering the Higgs boson but they either lacked uh, enough energy, so for example for the large electron uh, positron collider, th which is the uh, predecessor experiment, or like the predecessor accelerator to the Large Hadron Collider, or uh, a lack of luminosity, as it was uh, the case for the Tevatron at Fermilab in the US, which is another accelerator that is like uh, colliding protons and antiprotons. Okay, so you could probably think that the Higgs boson was produced or might have been produced in the Tevatron, no. Exactly, exactly. There were uh, definitely Higgs bosons produced at the Tevatron, but not, uh, not with enough statistics actually right. to have a discovery. Okay. And at lab, there were, of course, like some signs, but um, so this was not sufficient uh, for a discovery as well. So if the uh, lab collider would have had, would have been run with slightly higher energies, actually a discovery could have been possible. Cool. Okay. But then from the theory that Peter Higgs and the, his colleagues came up with, you didn't know the energy of the Higgs boson? Yeah, th exactly. This is unfortunately, um, the Higgs boson mass is uh, another free parameter in the theory. So there's nothing in the standard model that would have given like, um, like a hint what mass it is. There are 
Well, it's not entirely true. There are um, some mass ranges for which the theory would not have been valid. So there were like basically upper thresholds, but they were quite quite high. So in the end, it's still a very large mass range that had to be covered by experiments. Okay, okay. So then maybe let's talk a bit about the Large Hadron Collider and um, yeah, how does it work? <laughs> <laughs> so to keep it simple, the Large Hadron Collider is like a particle accelerator and collider which um, accelerates particles to almost the speed of light and you basically have two different, uh, so th this acceleration is based on um, cavities where you have like electromagnetic fields that basically give like particles passing these cavities uh, like with each passing like a kick, right, to increase their uh, velocity, right, and uh, with like sufficient um, s s circling time of the beams of particles that are inside of these accelerators, you reach then like a final energy. So in addition then to the cavities, which as said, like uh, provide like, uh, like the acceleration of the particles, you have then strong magnets, which keep the particles on track. So the Large Hadron Collider is a circular collider with a circumference of 27 kilometers. And in order to keep the uh, beam of protons on this circular track, you need then magnets that like bend their uh, like trajectories, right? Okay. And so, okay. And then these protons, they go around several times in this ring. Mm -hmm. And then what happens when they reach the final energy? So once they reach the final energy, we are uh, bringing them to collision at four distinct points. And at these points, they are like huge uh, detectors, which are basically like huge cameras, right? And they, these cameras detect then the collision of the protons and basically detect the uh, decay products of whatever is produced in these collisions. So what is it produced there? <laughs> so mainly it's like uh, standard model particles that we already know since like a long time ago. Okay. So most of uh, the particles produced there are some just some like meta particles um, that are not like very interesting. So like finding the interesting collisions from the, yeah, let's say boring ones, <laughs> is actually a very important task for the um, collaborations that are working with these detectors. Okay. So in, then with less, then uh, like, like the hi higher the mass of the particles that are produced, the less likely it is that these particles are produced, right? So the Higgs boson that is, has a relative high mass is um, significantly less likely to be produced than now these uh, meta particles. Okay. Right. So then basically you have a huge amount of background of a lot of boring particles and from that you have to somehow Find the, find the needle in the haystack. Okay. Exactly. So I guess that it's a challenging task for data analysis. <laughs> Uh, it, it partly is, yes. Um, luckily, in some cases, the Higgs boson or other heavy particles give very distinct signatures in the detector. So they look very different, um, or like at least in some cases, they can look very different than these uh, yeah, processes that we already know since like decades. And based on that, we can then separate them relatively well, right? But as I said, like in particular, these signatures that are so clean in the detector are relative uh, unlikely to occur, right? So you need to run 
the um, accelerator for quite some time um, and with uh, to, to collect sufficient data to uh, reach a sensitivity where you can finally claim the discovery or uh, as now measure the properties of the particle. Okay. Could you explain a bit more how the signature looks like of the Higgs boson? So, for example, um, one particular, uh, like, yeah, well, so called one of the golden channels of the Higgs boson where the discovery happened is a decay of the Higgs boson into two photons that are like back to back because it's like a two body decay. And uh, then the invariant mass or the mass of this diphoton system is equivalent with the Higgs boson mass. So basically you see an enhancement in the diphoton spectrum around the mass of the Higgs boson. Okay. So in your, then in your detector you look for specifically uh, signatures of photons that decayed basically 180 degrees. Um, exactly. Th this, is, this is one of the uh, yeah, so-called golden channels of the Higgs boson. Okay. The other one is a decay into two Z bosons, which, uh, further, which can further decay into um, le leptons like electrons or muons, right? So we would then have events in the detector with two electrons and two muons or four electrons or four muons, right? And also these kind of events are very well or relatively easy to separate from uh, all relevant backgrounds. Okay, because other particles don't produce these kind of signatures. Uh, I mean, we can have a non-resonant production of Z bosons, but they will not, their mass, like the mass of the this uh, ZZ system will not be distributed around the Higgs mass, but it will be like a spectrum. Ah, okay. So then you might get a spectrum with like a bump somewhere. Exactly, and exactly. And the bump corresponds to the Higgs boson. And basically to measure then other Higgs boson properties, you can concentrate yourself on the events that are in this bump. Okay, okay. Um, so how does this detector look like that you use for that? <laughs> like how can you distinguish within this detector all these different kind of particles? So these are very highly complicated devices that are built with uh, different um, te uh, technologies, right? In the, uh, let me maybe use the Atlas detector as an example since I'm working with this detector, the most inner part is a silicon tracking detector. You have basically like uh, several layers of silicon surrounding the interaction point and a an charged particle intersecting the silicon layers will create electron hole pairs, right? So these are like, uh, yeah, working as all kind of uh, semiconductors do, right? And like once these electron hole pairs are created, of course, they are like drifted to like uh, drifting to anodes and cathodes, which will give you like an electric signal in the end. So the fact that they are now, um, that, that you have now, now several layers of these silicon semiconductors after each other, you can basically, you, you obtain an ensemble of basically space points, which you can then with statistical procedures connect in order to reconstruct the flight path of a charged particle. Okay. So, so basically the particle leaves a trace in this. Exactly. So you, 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 per silicon layer, you obtain one space point, right? Because you know basically which kind of um, element uh, got like an energy deposit, right? Or like a charge deposit. And um, you know, of course, the position of this active element and 
as I said, this gives you then a space point that you can connect with other space points in the subsequent layers of the silicon detector. Okay. So then we have uh, gaseous tubes um, where you again obtain like an ionization or like sorry where you obtain an ionization of this gas whenever like charged particles fly through and these tubes are an additional measurements of space points right so you can have like large amount of tubes after each other to obtain like a large amount of space points and this will actually increase the precision with which you can determine this the flight path. So yeah, this is the inner so-called inner detector, which uh, is responsible for the reconstruction or with which we can uh, reconstruct the flight path of charged particles. But so this is only one of the components. The following ones are calorimeters, which are responsible or with which we measure the energies of particles. So depending on what kind of particles are incoming, you will of course have different interactions between meta and these particles, right? Um, so you have electromagnetic interacting particles like the electron or photons, or you have uh, hadronic interacting particles, which are uh, hadrons, such like ev basically everything built by quarks. So, for example, also protons w would be hadrons. For example, protons. If like protons are produced in the interactions, then there will be protons going through the detector. Neutrons are like other examples, right? Pions, kaons are other examples. So it is mainly pions that are produced in the interactions. And for the purpose of basically having energy measurements, both for electromagnetic interacting particles as well as hadronically interacting particles, we have two types of calorimeters. First, directly after the electromagnetic, uh, sorry, uh, directly after the inner detector, we have the electromagnetic calorimeter and hadronic particles, pions, neutrons, protons will like pass through the electromagnetic uh, calorimeter without depositing much of their energy, but they will eventually be stopped in the hadronic calorimeter. And I mean, the stopping of the particle is important in order to ensure that the, enti uh, the, ex the entire energy was deposited such that we can actually also measure the total energy of the particle that was going through the calorimeter. Okay, yeah, so then putting that into context with the signal that we were looking for earlier, that means that this inner detector where you reconstruct the path, that is how you get this directional information, for example, the two photons with 180 degree separation. Or uh, the photons, the maybe not. Pho <laughs> photons not because they are not charged, <laughs> only charged True. particles leave tracks in the inner detector, but we will find the photons then based on the, their energy and their shower shapes in the electromagnetic calorimeter. Okay, and there you also have some directional information, so then you can... Uh, I mean, we, we know... Well, yeah, basically, we have directional information. I mean, the, the Atlas detector is basically like a cylinder, right? So we are... Um, we will have uh, the photon going in... Uh, sorry, we will have the two different photons going in two different directions, and then basically the energy deposits in the electromagnetic calorimeters, as we can still determine the angle between them, right? So they will okay, still yeah. be have like an angle of 180 degrees between okay, them. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, cool. That sounds all very challenging to build <laughs> with a lot of technology. So... Um, that, so there, there is more to the detector. The most outer parts are muon chambers. These are again like tubes filled with gas and the gases then again are ionized by muons flying through them, right? So muons are minimal ionizing particles which will basically almost, will not leave any energy in the calorimeters, right? So they will basically pass right through them. So we need again then some tracking detector to 
show where the muons uh, went, right? Um, so in it, last but not least, we have like um, magnets inside of the Atlas detector to bend the flight path of charged particles, which is important because in order to measure the momentum of charge of particles based on the track, we need a deflection, right? So the curvature of the track will tell you what is the momentum of the particles that passed through the detector. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically it's like a big onion of different detectors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, this this like. picture, picture of an onion is like used as an analogy yeah. all the time. Okay. Um, and every particle leaves its trace. But then you have not only one collision at a time of protons, so pro how many particles are produced in like, I don't know, what you, how do you describe <laughs> it? Like oh, there is like <laughs> a large <laughs> multiplicity of particles. I mean, there are like two different things here. Like, first of all, there is a large number of particles produced every time two protons collide. Or basically, what really collides are the constituents of the proton. So the quarks and the gluons inside of the proton are what are colliding, right? So every time, like now, you have such a collision, there's a large, multipli large multiplicity of particles being produced. But then again, you also have like not only one proton colliding at the same time, but you have like up to 30 collisions every time that the bunches meet each other mm -hmm. in the center of the detector. Okay. So you really speak about like uh, hundreds of particles. Per collision. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you are, you are working with the Atlas detector, right? So exactly. could you tell us a bit like how you or like how your group or your colleagues contributed to this endeavor? <laughs> <laughs> um, so like the, the work is like mainly split. So there are people that work on the detector, that work on maintaining the detector, that work on upgrading this detector to make it like better. The uh, of, and I mean, there is of course radiation damage over the time, right? So components need to be replaced. And, uh, but we are also trying to improve the detector. Um, for example, adding tracking chambers to the like, forward region of the detector, right? So there's only like at the moment a certain like, um, uh, like angle that we can cover with the tracking detector and like there, there are people working also here at the Max Planck Institute to add further components to the tracking detector to basically also cover more um, larger range in the fo very forward direction, right? That is like relative parallel to the uh, beam axis, right? So mm -hmm. this is what I mean with forward direction. Ah, okay. So. In addition, then, there are like people working on the, anal on the analyzation of the data that is collected with this w detector. And this is what I'm mainly working on. So like since the last 10 years, I have been working on the analysis of data and uh, where I contributed to sev several activities. Okay. So Higgs boson property, measurements is one big field, but also searches for new heavy particles that are predicted and theories that extend the standard model. So one big example are um, like heavy brothers or sisters of the Higgs boson or um, yeah, completely different particles. Okay, so you now just mentioned, started to mention kind of what has been going on since the discovery of the Higgs boson because I guess I get for centuries people were just looking for that particle but now that we have it I guess there's a whole lot of new science that can be done with it. Exactly um, so I mean in 
like the discovery was in 2012, right? Back then, what was important is to measure the cross section, was to prove that the Higgs boson exists. And now, or like since then, we have been concentrating on trying to understand the properties of these particles better and better. One uh, important milestone is, for example, to determine the spin, right, to make sure that it is, it is actually a spin zero particle, because if uh, we would have found that the spin is different, right, then it would be obvious that this is actually not like a Higgs boson, but this is something completely different, which would be exciting, right, but it wouldn't, would not have helped with uh, like finding out whether there's a Higgs boson or whether this process of uh, electric symmetry breaking does exist or not. Okay. So do people in particle physics think in before the Higgs, after the Higgs? Is it like, uh, yeah, era before the Higgs and era <laughs> after the Higgs? Um, this is difficult to answer, <laughs> but I mean, I guess so maybe not like maybe not directly but like the field has changed since the discovery right so i mean um there was of course not a guarantee that the higgs exists right so the lhc was like designed to be a discovery machine right so um yeah, so a large fraction of the of the, the person power inside of the Atlas collaboration has uh, changed their focus since then, right? So before it was like a search for the Higgs boson and now that it's found, like the approach to dealing with it, it is different. Mm -hmm. And um, with the discovery of the Higgs boson, there have been, of course, like many new opportunities now to like conduct research. So like there are, of course, a lot of assumptions by like theorists, a lot of ideas, and like a lot of these ideas basically are based on the fact that this Higgs boson has a special role in the standard model. And so people are thinking, okay, if the Higgs boson has a special role, and the standard model, then um, it, it probably also has a special role in like theories that go beyond the standard model, right? Saying, I mean, the standard, so like the, the point here is that the standard model doesn't describe all phenomena seen in nature, right? So we know that the standard model, although it's a great theory that this predict, that gives like very precise prediction, it doesn't describe everything in nature, right? So like one thing that we already covered is gravity. Others are um, like dark matter, right? From astrophysics, we know that there are strong indications for the existence of dark matter. And uh, so now we need to understand, does dark matter exist? And if so, what, what is the exact nature of the dark matter. Other things is that um, we in, in our universe there's significantly more matter than antimatter. And um, the question is how did this happen? Because we assume, or we, we, th we, we think we're pretty sure that uh, matter and antimatter was, should have been produced in the early universe with the exact same Right, unless there is actually like a mechanism that like suppresses the production of antimatter, right? And so now these beyond the standard model theories attempt to explain these phenomena that we see. And a lot of people think that the Higgs boson actually plays an important role in, in these beyond the standard model or in the processes that would explain these open questions of the standard model. Hmm. Right, so the Higgs boson could be, for example, a portal to dark matter. Basically, like Higgs bosons could decay also to dark matter, while other particles would not 
interact with dark matter. Yeah, that kind of makes sense, right? Because we know about dark matter that it has some mass, <laughs> but it doesn't really interact with anything else. Otherwise, we probably would have found it or it rarely interacts. Well, mm -hmm. it makes sense to, to look for it in that kind of channel, like connected to the Higgs field and Higgs boson. Yeah, that sounds logical. <laughs> <laughs> so there are uh, then extensions of the Higgs sector. So, I mean, the, the Higgs mechanism as it is, was like introduced as like a minimalistic mathematical approach, basically. But I mean, in fact, we see in nature that not necessarily everything is like minimal minimalistic, right? So meta, for example, is um, exists in different so-called generations, right? We have the electron with the muon, which is basically like a heavy version of the electron, and we have a tau lepton, which is then like even more heavy than the electron and the muon, right? And so it could be that there are also like uh, yeah, heavy versions of Higgs bosons, right? In a non-minimalistic approach of this Higgs mechanism, right? And in these kind of non-minimalistic approaches, we have good candidates to explain uh, where these sources for the asymmetry between meta and antimeta are coming from. Okay. So then you now, what you mentioned that you, that is part of your work to look for these heavy yeah. Higgs boson brothers or sisters. <laughs> um, so is it, is it that you only look for new particles that are proposed by some theorists? Or do you also just like blindly look at your data and look for signatures that you cannot explain? Uh, both is done. And I think uh, this is the right approach that we do both. So we follow relatively strongly with some analysis efforts what theorists predict, what theorists tell us to look for. But there are also like search efforts that um, basically do model independent searches, just searching for exotic signatures, like, uh, like signatures with like a large number of leptons, uh, signatures with a large number of um, hadronic activity, or uh, like combining those. Okay. So what are what are the plans for the future for the LHC and like what what is the what are the next steps? So the I mean we will of course continue like the searches for new heavy particles, right? With the more uh, statistics we collect, the more sensitive we get to higher and higher masses, right? So there is a quite large kinematic range that we need to cover, and we are only getting now. Or like we, we, will, we get gradually more and more sensitive to higher and higher masses, right? So the, yeah, w I mean, of course we d don't know where the new physics is hiding and uh, we, we need to keep looking for the needle in the haystack. At the same time, there, there will be um, measurements of Higgs boson properties that we are not sensitive to yet but that we will be sensitive to later. Like one important aspect is the coupling strength of the Higgs boson to itself. And so we will be sensitive to, these, to, to this parameter, or to this property of the Higgs boson only by the end of the LHC runtime, so at some point in 2030 to 40. Okay. So, so there's still a long way to go. Yeah. So what does this self-coupling exactly mean? <laughs> so the, basically the strength with, the, with which the Higgs boson couples to itself. Mm -hmm. So basically the rate with which you produce um, Higgs boson events where you have like um, two Higgs bosons being produced at the same time. Okay. <laughs> and that is another 
just an information that you need about the Higgs boson to understand it. Better. So actually, uh, yeah, I, the, the question is of course how <laughs> how technical we should, uh, <laughs> we should get, get here, here with our discussions, <laughs> um, how deep we want to dive into the um, in, into the math. So the point is that like for the Higgs mechanism. Uh, in order to explain that, you also need to like uh, like formulate a, like a Lagrangian for the um, to describe the kinematics of the Higgs boson and basically also the potential of the Higgs boson. Now, the potential has a, is, is like very important in this context in this process, and because in order to obtain or to describe the um, spontaneous symmetry breaking that is important for the Higgs me mechanism for the process of electroweak symmetry breaking, you kind of need this so-called Mexican head structure. The only way to confirm the shape of the Higgs boson potential is by measuring the self-coupling strength of the Higgs boson. Okay. Okay. So, in order to verify really the process of electroweak symmetry breaking, like in order to verify the Higgs mechanism itself, you need to measure this self-coupling strength. Okay, so it's still part of the theory that is not confirmed yet. Exactly, yeah. And you will only get there in 10 years or so, <laughs> 10 to 20 years. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and with like lots and lots of more data. Yeah, so that's a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. But uh, also, also good to have a plan, I guess. <laughs> so um, what, what would be your wish, would be the next particle that you could find at LHC? Oh, I, I, I if want... You, if you could wish it for it. <laughs> I want uh, heavy additional Higgs bosons. Okay. That, that w I think would be the most exciting thing to find. To explain this antimatter matter imbalance. Uh, yeah, but uh, but uh, actually it would explain quite other things okay. as well. It, it, this is one of the one examples of that mm -hmm. could be explained by additional Higgs bosons. Okay, well then uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> I wish you all the best <laughs> for finding that. And um, yes, thank you so much for taking the time for this episode. Thanks. It was my pleasure. That's it. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to learn more about the Higgs boson, the Atlas detector or the Large Hadron Collider, feel free to check out the website of the Max Planck Institute for Physics. Until next time, bye! Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net and the Science Communication Working Group known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Serena Brankoma and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Corizzo. For any feedback, comments or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspringblogpodcast at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy.